Okay, it's 7.02. Let's begin. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 12.07 at 7.02. Do we want to pledge or do we want to, we have no flag today. Should we skip that piece? I do have a flag here. Okay, then let's go for it. Wait a second. There we go. It is. All right, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of, America. of America. Go ahead. And to the republic, to the republic for, for which, which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation under God. God, liberty, indivisible, with justice, justice for, for all. us. For all. Oh, we did. <laughs> great job. Um, to read our mission statement, our mission is to address needs and concerns of our disabled residents and provide their full participation in the activities and services of Wakefield. So as I as we indicated on the agenda tonight, we have Chris Carino with us from the Albion Cultural Exchange. Um, Lois, uh, Lorna, Sherry and I went over yesterday to meet Chris and to see um, their space there. Um, and Chris is going to just bring us up to date on what they've done so far um, and specifically talk a little bit about uh, the handicapped access. So Chris, I will turn it to you. All right, great. Can everybody hear me? I'm off mute and everything. Sure. Yeah, okay, yes. great. Uh, again, my name is Chris Carino. I'm the chairperson of the Albion Cultural Exchange Committee. Uh, we run the building at 9 Albion Street, uh, also known as the Albion Cultural Exchange, which is a former 1910 era post office. And uh, I gave uh, some members of the group yesterday a tour of our building who can uh, vouch for some of the details on some of the things for the people that, that weren't there. Uh, we've been in existence for five or six years at this point, and we are an art gallery and a, a, a performance space and a meeting space in downtown Orlando. Uh, yeah, Orlando. Sorry, I've been traveling. Downtown <laughs> we wish we were in downtown Orlando. Yeah, we do. It's cold out today. In, uh, what do you call it, uh, downtown Wakefield. And uh, we've, we, uh, as a committee, received this building uh, to sort of manage and figure out what it means to be an arts and culture center. Uh, like I said, about uh, five years ago. And over the last uh, several years, we've gotten a few grants. And one of our primary um, you know, obligations uh, as far as uh, developing out our space has been to increase the accessibility so that we can include everyone as an art and culture space that encompasses everything from painting to uh, knitting to doing clay to, so it's not just visual art, it's performing art. We've had everybody from Joe Gatto, who's a chef in uh, uh, Saugus, uh, Sto actually Stoneham come through. We've had Donald Wong come through and do some, uh, he does a thing called Chi Gong. We've had the bread shop come through. So we've had a lot of folks come through, uh, but we do have a 1910 uh, building, which is not as accessible as things uh, are today or as we like things to be today. And we have received a few grants uh, to the tune of about $200,000 over the last uh, several years. And we've been prioritizing that money for accessibility. Within the last year or so, we put in new bathrooms and uh, folks uh, yesterday saw them, but here's a quick little sort of, a, the camera can see that picture of our new bathrooms that we put in. Yeah. These are gender neutral, uh, fully ADA compliant uh, bathrooms uh, as designed by our architect who is certified in that, that sort of thing. Uh, it was a very expensive <laughs> endeavor. Uh, at a two, uh, We started at $87,000 and we spent about just under 100,000 to uh, complete them. And they're fully wheelchair uh, accessible. Uh, and uh, I think they look pretty nice. Did, did yeah, they're me? Very, nice. very nice. So very that's, nice. that's what we've done so far. And uh, we uh, presented to the town council a few weeks ago about actually our sign that we're putting out front, but we also touched on some other accessibility improvements that we have about ready to go. And they had suggested that uh, we talk with you all as uh, primary stakeholders uh, regarding accessibility for town buildings um, and just get some feedback before we went out to bid with anything to make sure that we weren't really missing anything. And just, you know, another set of eyes is always a great thing to have. And so, uh, you know, I say uh, my latest phrase is that, you know, uh, patience is the strongest muscle. And uh, so we want to make sure all the stakeholders, no matter how long it takes to 
you know, get involved, uh, can, can see what we're doing and that we don't waste any money and that we're accommodating the most people possible. Uh, to that end, I explained to the group yesterday, uh, our next step uh, after doing our uh, accessible bathrooms was to make our entrance accessible because our building is on a street that has a little bit of grade. So our main entrance has a step up, which is not handicap friendly. Uh, and we have uh, another entrance, uh, we call it the Chestnut Street entrance in the back that's a little bit more uh, level, uh, level with the pavement. So we worked with our architects uh, on various options for the front uh, as well as for the back. And we also work with the Envision team who are doing sidewalks and other things in downtown about some options trying to get uh, our accessibility through the front initially. Uh, however, uh, we ran into some financial constraints there. And uh, so we started exploring other ways to make it so that we could become accessible uh, quicker. And so we came up with our second entrance on Chestnut Street side, uh, the ability to, uh, we planned out uh, an entrance and this entrance is fully uh, ADA accessible, handicap accessible, all the details that you need to be compliant. It has automatic doors or will have automatic doors, two of them, and it will be accessible from the Chestnut Street side and with the help of some um, hardscaping of, uh, off of our Chestnut Street entrance, uh, we should be basically a roll-up friendly um, entrance. Additional items that we spoke, uh, spoke about uh, during the tour yesterday are we have plans for an elevator down, uh, down the road to make it so that we can get to all three floors. Right now, uh, we're talking about entering in on essentially our ground level or our second floor, so to speak, which is at ground level but uh, our master plan for the building includes having artist workspaces, uh, loft spaces up top, or as the state calls them, innovation spaces up top, as well as potentially classrooms and storage downstairs. So we wanna make it so that people can get to all the floors. So as we were planning our accessibility for uh, what ended up being the rear entrance, we also took a look at our future projections for when we would be able to get an elevator. It's a much more expensive endeavor coming in right now, estimates between $360,000 and $500,000, which we don't have right now. However, we have been fortunate with the help of Donald Wong and Jason Lewis and Paul Broder and a few others from the state to receive a couple hundred thousand dollars in grants. And uh, with that money, we spent the first half of that on our bathrooms. And then with the second half of that, we've specced out the rear Chestnut Street entrance and uh, we put together plans that cost about $50,000 and we have the money and we're getting you know, really close to going out to bid. And this is just another uh, step of the due diligence and speaking with all the various stakeholders, uh, yourselves included, to say, hey, here's what we're doing. Um, we think we're going down the right path. We are fortunate in that many situations we have money, we have plans drawn. So we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at different options and, and settling on the Chestnut Street side as our primary side. Uh, this does not preclude having more uh, uh, accessibility options through our Albion Street side. However, the finances on that are uh, much more significant and we don't have funding for that at the moment. So after exhausting and doing lots of due diligence over the last year or so, we are about ready to go on, on the, uh, the rear entrance and getting ready to spend, like I said, around $50,000 uh, to make a uh, rear ADA wheelchair friendly accessible entrance. Uh, quick uh, sort of picture, I'll throw this up, see if you can see this on the screen. Can you see that? It's real simple. Uh, and it's basically, you know, it just looks like a door and it's an automatic door. And uh, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. And I, and, I can, and I can send that, but it's, it's not really, there's, there's not much to see other than it's, it's, it's a nice brand new door with lighting. And as the, the team saw yesterday, currently the grading over there is a little bit of mess. It's, uh, it's where three properties meet, and, but it's at the end of a very smooth uh, access uh, parking lot. So there's, it's, it's a fire lane painted over. It's an access easement. Uh, it's an easy roll up. When you get to the edge of our easement and towards our property, there's a step down, there's a step up, the grading's a little messed up. With our money and with our design, we've uh, worked with our architect to make it so that it is a smooth roll from the sidewalk right up through our easement, right into our building. And so with the hardscaping improvements that we plan to make, uh, there'll be no more steps. 
People will be able to roll right in from the street uh, with assistance or without assistance, depending on you know how independent the person is uh, using, a, and I'm talking about somebody on a wheelchair. And they can come up. There's two automatic doors. They'll come up, there'll be a push button. They'll push the button. It'll open up one automatic door. It'll let them in. They'll get into like a vestibule. That door can shut and there'll be another push button, which will then open them up into our main gallery. And so that's about where we're at now. Um, we've prioritized all of our money uh, in the short time that we've existed for accessibility. Uh, as I said to the team, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we get that taken care of first. But, you know, there's people out there that would rather, you know, uh, they, who don't have issues who would say, hey, why can't you put in a new floor? Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? And the idea is that we, we you know, our priorities are accessibility first, and then we, we move on. So we have other things that we need to do to bring our building forward. And we have about $2 million or a million and a half to $2 million worth of things in various plans that are pie in the sky items but we put, uh, we put our first $200,000 into making access, access for all. So the idea I believe was just to sort of bring the team in, talk about this a little bit and I'll stop talking here in a sec and, and just let the folks that were there um, comment and, and or ask questions for anybody that has them. Uh, but you know, we're at a point now where we believe that <laughs> with our funding, with our designs, with the work that we've been doing for the last you know, year plus on this, that we will be, um, you know, essentially compliant uh, by March or April if we get our things out to bid in the next month or so. And so we showed that to the team. We think, uh, we think that's great. And, uh, you know, then after that, we'll be on to, uh, to other projects uh, that are more, you know, aesthetically pleasing and, and um, you know, visual things once we, once we get past that. But we feel confident that uh, we're doing a good job. We feel confident that we've thought things out uh, fairly well. Uh, we also will be adding uh, in the future, and by the future I say three to five years, hopefully more accessibility through our Albion Street side. However, the funding for that is uh, over $100,000. It's a whole different level of, uh, of needs, and we felt it was important to act as quickly as possible to make the building uh, you know, mostly accessible uh, now, rather than wait on various things that could put us out three to five years um, to if we chose to just only go with the Albion Street side. So uh, with that, I, I think I covered everything. I could keep talking, but it would probably just double back on things I've already said. Um, that, that's what I have to offer and present and, and ask for comments and feedback. on. Thank you, Chris, um, for your time tonight and also for hosting us yesterday. Um, I think you've spent the money you've received to date well. Um, and I agree that the first step should be to m make that facility accessible for all um, so that everybody can begin to use it. And then, as you say, aesthetically, you can, um, you can update it as, as the funding allows. Does anybody have any questions, um, particularly those who didn't get to go yesterday? And if you don't know what we do, even though I gave a little bit of an explanation, I can explain that too. Just like, you know, what are we getting access to and why, why do we want to go there? LaVon, you had a question? Yeah. Um, well, first, I just want to say um, thank you for uh, taking the time to put into that space because I, I, my uh, oldest child uh, was part of an art exhibit that was exhibited there and it was a nice space. It was great for uh, to mingle with the community and to uh, see the art that the students produce. So it's a nice space. Um, but I wanted to ask one question about the entrance in the, around the back. Is that an entrance that everybody can use? Yes. Okay. And is it going to be kind of, is the, is the main entrance still going to be the front entrance or will the back entrance become the main entrance or will they be used interchangeably what's the plan for that well the plan is that they'll be used interchangeably and we use uh and you know, we try not to use the term back entrance front entrance although it's obvious what's the fronts so i i try to call it the chestnut street entrance because it's by no means uh inferior to the front entrance it's just on a different street and it comes in through the uh you know through i guess what you know is the back of the building but i like to just say the chestnut street entrance and we've used that currently to, for people to load in projects 
but we've had a lot of people, including handicapped people, come to the back and say, hey, well, you know, there's a spot over here or parking's easier over here because parking's harder. There was no spots on Albion Street. So I parked right behind it and I got out of my car and they managed to hobble over, you know, up one step and down one step. So it's, it's uh, reasonably accessible. Uh, we don't have any signage um, on the entrance at the moment, but we'll likely go back. We're putting signage on, on the front of the building, but we'll likely go back and, and, and maybe put a little logo type thing above it, but it, it, it will be well lit. And we have taken, um, taken time to spend on the hardscaping because we want it to be a visually pleasing thing. It's, you know, now it's, it's kind of ugly. Um, but when we're done, after we spend $50,000 and buy, you know, pavers and, and color coded things that look right and put up signs and that sort of stuff, it's going to go from more of like a, I don't want to describe it too horribly, but like a barren, you know, city wasteland, like, you know, a back entrance, if you will. Like an alleyway. Being, yeah, to being, a, you know, another primary entrance to get into the facility. And with the new doors, uh, the, the new automatic doors, we're also going to replace the windows on our the area that includes our vestibule and those windows are going to be translucent. So right now it's got just regular windows that you can look through. The windows will be sort of, you know, fogged up with a iridescent translucent -y kind of thing where it lets light in through our main gallery and just sort of has, I don't know, more of an artsy look, more of a polished finished look. And with the hardscaping in the front, we really hope to achieve a, a look that looks like a complete finished, you know, second, uh, not even secondary entrance, you know, just other entrance. You, you kind of answered my second part of my question, but I just wanted to make sure I, I heard you right. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask you is how will people know that there's a second entrance? And like, you know, a lot of people may, uh, even beyond people with mobility issues, you know, women or, or families with um, children in strollers or whatever, they may, other people may want to use that entrance as well uh, because of the, you know, the automatic entry and just, you know, just for other reasons. Will there be clear signage that there's, a, that there's another entrance available and how do you plan on making people aware of that entrance? We absolutely will have signage on our front uh, on the sort of flush do you have a wheelchair? Hey, do you have other needs to that effect? We haven't specifically written that into the plans, uh, but signage and signage from Chestnut Street are all part of the plan as far as um, as we polish it off and as we complete it and as we put it onto our website and we, li uh, we list it in there. There'll definitely be marketing for that uh, as well as a uh, sign for that. At our, uh, at our events, we generally have like a greeter. Whenever we have an event, there's usually somebody by the door kind of keeping an eye on things like an ombudsman, so, so to speak. And if we see people come up that would benefit from using the alternative Chestnut Street entrance, we can uh, push them, uh, We not push them, but we can you know, inform that, hey, you can just roll around the corner here and roll right in so you don't have to go up the step. In the future with the Envision project, which is a big downtown uh, multi-phase project, um, they're doing the first phase, which actually starts just past our building at this point, um, in the spring, but in about two years or so, they're gonna do the downtown phase. So we're in downtown phase two. During downtown phase two, we hope to increase uh, our, our uh, door, uh, door availability and also have automatic doors on the front. Um, there are some contingencies there. And, and one of the reasons that we didn't, and we discussed yesterday that we didn't um, go with the front door was because it's so far out into the future. And another reason was that I asked for specific um, guarantees that if we took our funding and uh, you know, didn't spend it towards the back and we spent it towards the front and we made automatic doors there with the idea that eventually there'll be a ramp. Uh, now, the, the important thing to know here is that money that's spent sort of outside the building on the sidewalk and the streetscape side gets paid for through the, the Envision project and that sort of stuff. Uh, the door portion of it, which would still be $50,000 if we flip to the front, is, is our expense. So if, the, uh, if we took our money, we said, hey, if in the future you can guarantee us that we can put a ramp in the front, we'll, uh, we'll equip the door now, even if it delays being able to use it for the idea that 
we want to you know favor sort of the primary entrance sort of the opposite of what i was saying earlier with the alternative entrance um because you know that would be something that some people some people tend to favor and the thing was we couldn't at this time and it doesn't mean forever we couldn't get guarantees that if we put a ramp in there that the sidewalk could be made wide enough uh to accommodate that because when we put the ramp in it's going to take up basically half the sidewalk which gets into a larger conversation of moving parking spots and um and that sort of thing which gets really um really edgy downtown um what we do have as far as uh, somebody that were to use a handicapped spot to come in the closest spot out the front is on the corner of Foster's at Albion Street, just next to the item. There's a spot there. And there's also a handicapped spot at the corner of Chestnut Street and Main Street. So folks could go to either one of those spots. If they went to Foster Street and Albion Street, they can literally roll right across the street and right through the parking lot and into our Chestnut Street side entrance because that goes by the old Century 21, that sort of cut through, if you know what I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. you can roll right in there just as easy as you could roll in the front door. If you came in off Chestnut Street and you parked in a handicapped spot at the corner of Chestnut and Main, you just push back up one building and across the easement and you can go right in there. So as far as, uh, you know, ease to get to the back, um, you know, they're, they're both, uh, it, it's pretty easy to get to. And yes, we will definitely have signage. And, uh, and that's it on that, yeah. Thank you. Um, first, Chris, questions? Yes, hello. Um, first, Chris, it's nice to meet you. Um, meet you as well. Uh, I have a few questions. So oh, one thing that I did notice that I think you use different lingo, something that may be easier, that is, um, that may be helpful is just accessible entrance um, moving forward just because handicap is dated, as well as alternative entrance is, um, you know, it just accessible, accessible in general, because that could relate to Levon's point on how anyone, regardless of any kind of mobility disabilities, may need to use this. Um, and then could I see the picture again of the door of the, of the chestnut tree entrance? Awesome. And, uh, is, are those lines on the ground, will those be yellow for people who are blind or are you going we, to include We it? haven't actually specified the color palette of it. And I can okay. send, I can send this to you. Sure. This is, this is out of a presentation. I was actually going to send some stuff earlier today, but it was sort of intertwined with a bunch of other info. And I wanted to make sure that we stayed focused on what we were talking about, uh, you know, tonight, because it, it, it's this door and it was built in with a bunch of other things. The hardscaping on that, we're choosing uh, the color palette now. And uh, I don't think yellow is there. I've got the, the list of them, but it is going to be, uh, you know, noticeably uh, differentiated from the building. So you'll be able, it, it won't like all look like brick. It'll, <laughs> it'll be that so that there's the, the lines there now, but the actual pattern has, hasn't been uh, determined completely. Okay. Um, and, and so it, it'll be there. We did look at... Um, architects like to draw pictures. So when we had them do that, you know, they gave us four different versions of it. We chose the most uh, financially prudent one with simple lights and simple, uh, simple uh, hardscaping, uh, simple but notable hardscaping. We had ones that had um, like these um, sort of metal outline doors that kind of came down in a geometrical configuration that, you know, made it really noticeable. We had other ones that had like these random pole designs. And I think the architect was really going with, hey, this is an art center, let's do some funky stuff. And it was cool to look at and you know, worth the time to look at these different iterations. But all of those iterations took our door from 50 to $80,000, you know, from 50, you know, to do these weird things that inevitably someone's gonna be like, you know, why'd you do that? And we, we have many other needs. We, we need new floors in our building. We need to put money into our sprinkler fund because we need to upgrade things for that. We're looking for a half million dollars for an elevator. So we're on the front end of, uh, of our money and uh, we don't really, didn't really have time to do a lot of you know, visually aesthetic stuff, but the hardscaping will look good because it, you know, it's, it's been neglected at this point. So it's kind of, you know, it's pretty ugly looking, but when you put in some new windows and you put in a new door and an automatic uh, door and you put in modern lights um, and light everything up and put in signage, it'll look like a totally different place. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to double check that 
those who are blind will they'll be differentiated um you know any kind of i know you said there's a slight kind of uphill maybe i'm well there's maybe... it, there's there's a couple steps now but with the hardscaping those are all going to go away yeah. so there 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 will be at minimal like maybe a one percent grade or whatever whatever the acceptable limit is this is again this is an architecture thing where they know what the rules are that's you know i'm the business manager guy um, and so they, you know, we talked to, we can't have steps, you know, it needs to, there needs to be no flaw in, 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 in what's going on here. So I'm confident in our team uh, that, uh, you know, that, that they have done that. Great. Yeah. Thanks for answering the questions. Maeve, is there a preference to color for those lines? For those that are visually impaired, is there some color sure. that's recommended? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nope. So we use, it's, it's not only for people who are completely blind, but people who are visually impaired sometimes have trouble seeing slight changes in grade or even like the edge of like where the edge of the step is. And so like in my school building, we have yellow on all the edges of the steps because we have some visually impaired students that need that for safety. So Mm -hmm. A bright color sometimes indicates to people that there's a, a change in grade or just to like watch your step. Okay. I can, I can definitely take that to our team. I don't think that's anything that any but, well, I would reasonably be offended by. Yeah, a lot of architects, I think, would know that if they're, a, you know, if they're tuned into ADA requirements and stuff. Okay. Uh, but Especially I'll bring that back to our, our discussion. Yeah, when there's a curb cut, usually, like, lately, they've been putting yellow, like, um, textured, you might notice textured, uh, like a mat where the curb yep. cut is. So I've got down here, uh, yellow and colors of the hardscaping and textured mat, uh, you know, concerns or, you know, um, things that would to be delineate not. edging and change in grading. Okay. And I, I, my, I would say that I would reasonably assume it's in our plans. However, we are going to over everything with the fine tooth comb so that I will definitely uh, make sure that that is uh, included. And, and once we're done, of course, I'll come back to you all and say, Hey, we did it. Come back and see. And if we need to do anything more, you know, uh, you know, let us know. Um, we are fortunate in that we have funding for this, and I'm sure, you know, as you know, as far as yellows and colors and things like that, if there's signage tweaks and stuff like that, once we are complete, I don't think it would be uh, unreasonable or, or um, you know, hard to make modifications. You know, as we get to the polishing up states of, hey, you know what, your signs over here, uh, the letters need to be bigger. Um, it needs to have a different background or can you put something over here? Uh, that sort of thing. Another thing uh, in talking with our abutters is that I've talked to uh, Santander Bank, um, talking to their property management company and their actual owners of, uh, of that lot that's behind there. And uh, we're just talking to them about the idea of, you know, hey, we're being neighborly, we're using this access because it's allowed by law and this is sort of, you know, why, why these things are here. Um, because we'd love to get them to develop the whole corridor. Right now, it's just a fire lane. If you're coming up Chestnut Street, you get to the end of the bank and you see, you know, there's the parking lot and they've got their little ATM in the middle of it and you see a fire lane painted. And the reason why that fire lane's there, in addition to being a fire lane, is because it's an access easement. So the reason that the size of it is very specific to the way that it is, is not per necessarily because of the fire lane thing, is because that's the legally recorded you know, uh, area that people have permission to cross and it's a nice flat space. And what we're sort of starting to say to them is, hey, once we polish out the back here and things start to look a lot better, um, which is a benefit to them as well because it dresses up their property because we, we butt up to each other. Um, you know, m might it make sense to, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, put up a little, you know, a little wall and some, some plants or, you know, some, some hardscaping things that make it look like a much more attractive and, and together place. And if, if you look at the things that the folks at the, uh, uh, the Envision folks are doing, that's exactly what they're doing. They're looking at hardscaping throughout the entire downtown. So what they're doing on Albion Street, 
um, and they'll do on our little clip of Albion Street in phase two is not only are they talking about the colors and the patterns and the, and the widths of the sidewalks and how high is everything and does the curb look okay? Um, do we want trees? And, and they've decided on, you know, what types of trees they want and, and do they want benches or do they want blocks or do they want geometrical figures to just make it a visually pleasing, you know, aesthetic. And so the idea is as they do this first phase of Envision on Albion Street and get ready for a second phase, that we say to our butters and you know the people uh, that are around us, just like, hey, we've got a wrench and we've got this thing, and right now it's just a, fi a fire lane with stripes across it, and it's available. But in the future, can we make it more visually pleasing for everybody, um, just to make everything look like it, you know, uh, to make everything just flow together in a, in, a, in a positive, fun, and visually pleasing way. And hopefully they will agree. We'll, yeah, we'll see what we'll see what happens there. I know that the building, the Santander building, uh, Santander Bank, has a so they don't own the building there. Um, they have a lease with uh, the owner, uh, and their lease is through 2025. And because of the way that the legal description is of the property, um, if the if the building were to sell in the next, you know, anytime from from now on out, um, they would always have to leave that access open. So if they said, hey, we want to put a parking garage in what's the parking lot now, not that parking garages have had a lot of success in Wakefield, but let's say that they did. Uh, or they wanted to put a building. Maybe they said, hey, we don't want this to be a parking lot anymore. Or maybe the parking lot's going to be our basement parking for the new building where we're going to put in here. That, and I believe it's, it's either 14 or 18 foot wide access easement from Chestnut Street cannot be touched. Now they, they might you say, hey, we want to, um, you know, maybe they want to re-hot top it, you know, maybe, and this is where we get to the point of maybe it's no longer a fire lane if they put a building in there and it's just a path. And that path um, has, you know, much, has like a visual aesthetic and, and, and um, hardscaping that matches the rest of downtown because downtown Wakefield is going to look a lot different in five to 10 years as they start doing these hardscaping. So Albion Street is the prototype. And like I said, there's, there's things, if you get into those plans and you look at those documents, uh, they talked from everything from benches to geometric figures and they're somewhere in between. They have a lot of lush gardening stuff in there, but everything is, is uh, being made to look like it all works together, despite the fact that there's many, uh, many different landowners, including the municipality, which is, which is you know, our town. Any other questions for Chris? No. Well, Chris, we again very much appreciate you taking the time to come out and host us yesterday and to talk with us tonight. Um, I'll speak on behalf of the committee. I think that you've covered all the basis at, at this point um, for that accessible edits and um, you know, let us know if we need to do anything else in support of that. Fantastic. And again, uh, you know, I, this is just a, a first time. This isn't an only time engagement. So I think as we finish this, uh, you know, we'll bring you down and say, hey, here's here's what happened. Uh, and and, you know, fine tuning is, you know, is the collaborative thing. So if our signage is wrong, if the colors are a little weird or if we need to add color or any of these concerns, which I've, that I've noted down here, color, uh, you know, hardscape uh, and, and sizing and that sort of stuff. You know, if, if we don't always get everything right. You know, I'd like to hope we do, but if we don't get it right, you know, let's figure out how to make it right. Or, you know, hey, as we do this in the future. And we're also, like I said, you know, out there probably two, three, four, five years down the road, we'll be doing this to the front. But we thought it was important to do this as quickly as possible and not wait. Uh, and we also talked a little bit about our elevator in the future. Um, that's out there a little bit because we have to get the funding for that. Unlike this project, which is really just, you know, hey, we're all talking about it, but we're, we don't have a stop because we have the money um, that we have a lot of stops on. And we did research to make sure that we're not wasting money. And, and we talked about that yesterday. But as we get ready to do an elevator, the thing that came up yesterday that I took notes on was uh, somebody had told me that uh, I said, oh, well, there might be a door heading to the outside and a door heading to the inside. And there were some concerns about how we, we can figure those things. Um, those are things out in the future, and we'll be having, you know, conversations, if not in your meeting, maybe we'll invite your team to one of our meetings 
as we start mm -hmm. looking at that and we and we have architecture plans you know on the table and when we do these plans like i said we usually have three or four alternatives and then we just start ruling them out as to which one's the best one um, when we do that process which will be you know a lot more money and a couple couple years down the road we'll collaborate on that uh, before we spend that kind of money to put in an elevator to make sure that you know not only are we providing uh, an accessible entrance did I do it right you told me how to do that <laughs> an accessible entrance yeah. uh, uh, on the main on our main level uh, we'll look at things like okay now you get on the elevator and you go downstairs well what happens when you open up the door there what does it look like around that doorway? And that's stuff that I, you know, we'd, we'd seek, uh, you know, counsel on, as well as when we have people going up to the top floor. So we've got everything great to get on the elevator. We get our doors facing the right way. Everyone's happy on that. But then we'll have two more floors to look at two more entrances on the same silo. And we'll want to make sure that we get them all right. Well, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions along the way that you think we might um, be able to give input on. Okay. Don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you for your time tonight. And if anybody has any questions, I'm just an email away. If you want to see the details of these plans, I've got documents for miles. Um, you know, they're kind of boring. This, the pictures that I showed you, those, that's the best part of the documents. The rest of it's all just a murderous amount of words. <clears throat> well, thank you again. No worries. You're certainly welcome to stay on, but I'm sure you have a million other things that you would like to do. So um, feel free to leave whenever you when ready. All right, I'm gonna mute myself and then I'll probably disappear visually in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much. Good. Thank you. No thank worries, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm, I'm going to enjoy watching the transformation of that building yes. in a very positive way. Okay, so um, next on the agenda is the approval of the meeting minutes from November 2nd. I don't know if everybody had an opportunity. Darcy had sent them out um, to take a look at them. Um, if everybody is set, would somebody like to make, make a motion to approve those meeting minutes? I make a motion to approve I'll make Oh, go ahead, Darcy. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. And I'll second the motion. Then, very good, thank you. All right. So Lois isn't here tonight regarding the financial report, but I suspect that there's not been any change from the prior months. So we talked a little bit about the Post Academy I know that some folks were not able to view it. So are you interested in me um, attempting to share my screen <laughs> and play this thing for you? Yes, yes, I am. Okay. All right, let's see what I can do here. First, I have to figure out how to share the screens. Okay. The green button. There we go, see it. Share screen. Door. Share. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's hope we can make this thing play. Did you share your sound as well? Oh. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna wanna unshare it and then share it again. There's a box on the Left hand corner, you got to make sure that's checked off so we can hear it. Okay, so share screen. Yep. And then where's this box? Look down in the left hand corner. It should say um, share sound or share audio. It should, or maybe it says share computer sound. Nope, I do not see that. Let's see. Advanced sharing options. No, I don't see that. Well, let's play it. And then if you can't hear it, um, we'll figure out a plan B. 
So you're not, um, and I don't have you muted. All right, let's try this. Right, you can see, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's see yep. now what happens. Maybe I can turn my audio up if, if that poses a problem. Yeah, we, we cannot hear it. Yeah, there's no sound. There's no sound. Okay, let's try it again then. Um, you, share computer sound. Here we go. Let's, all right, let me start this over. Hi, Maria Botaro, job coach for Post Academy. Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's drive it from the beginning. My name is Karen Leahy, and I'm the lead teacher and the unofficial program coordinator at Post Academy. And we are a school for students with disabilities from 18 to 22. And then they leave our program and they go on to adult programming from there. I'm Brian Malay. I'm the vocation at Post Academy. So I oversee all of the students' internships and do vocational-based lessons in the classroom. Hi, Maria Botaro, job coach for Post Academy. I'm responsible for the students at their job sites. It stands for Purposeful Opportunities for a Successful Transition. So our mission is to prepare these students for as independent a life as they'll be able to and being a productive member of society. A day is not always the same. It always changes up. We do begin with them coming in and go into some lecture, and then going out to jobs. So each student would go to different job sites, and they will always have a job coach with them. They come back. We do cleaning daily, which is do the cleaning upon what you would be doing at home. And then once a week, we do food shopping and cooking, and the students get to choose what they would want to cook. Community trips are used as a way to just continue to develop some of their skills in the community. That includes travel training. We'll take the MBTA bus or the train sometimes. We'll plan trips. So if we're taking the bus, we'll use the MBTA trip planner, and the students will be able to determine what stop we need to take. It's also just the educational piece. We'll go to museums. We'll go to zoos. We'll do history tours or go to different historical sites. Because community is such a big part of these students' lives, we really want to get them out there, you know, making purchases, finding items, knowing how to use money, knowing how to use public transportation. Sometimes we do social things with other groups so that they get that social piece, trying to ex open their eyes to what's around them in their communities. The biggest difference that we see with other 18- to 20-year-old programs is that we are sub-separate, so a lot of those schools are, are in the high school and attached to the high school and a part of that building, and we're not. We like that because it offers the kids kind of like they're going off to college as opposed to just staying at the same high school they've been at for four years. You know, we don't have math, social studies, English, history. We teach life skills and we teach skills that our, our students are going to be able to use for the rest of their lives to try to be independent and get a job and work and pay bills and, you know, live on their own. So if you're listening and you want to be involved with Post Academy, there are a couple different ways you can do so. We have a recycle bin on the left-hand side of the high school, past like the loading dock, and then there's another little like inlet. We collect those cans and they redeem them, and then we have like a petty cash in the office if, say, somebody comes in someday and doesn't have money to go on the community trip, and that's what we use that money for. And also, if you're a business and you could use some helpers in the office or to have students run errands for you, just let us know. Call us at 781-587-1130 and leave a message. Or you can check us out on Facebook. They did a nice so job. That was, that was great. They yeah. did a really nice job. They did a really nice job. I'm very thankful to WCAT. I thought that was really nice of them to collaborate with. How many um, students are at Post Academy? Total, do you know? I don't. Um, at this time, I think it's sort of a small 
crew right now. I think when my son Dan was there, they were in that Dan's year was the first year of this program. I think there were about 12 um, students. It was, it was sort of a large group. And then, you know, they come and go, they turn 22, 22 is their last day there. So if it's in the wing, Wednesday in the middle of February, they're gone. And then, um, you know, they all kind of come in together at the beginning of the school year, but they depart um, upon their, the day of their 22nd birthday. So um, they could have started out with more kids than they end up with at the end of the year, depending on, you know, folks, folks age. But it's, it's a great program. It started the 2015, 2016, I believe, school year. Um, and it's been, it's been ongoing. Um, and they've been, they've managed to sustain themselves. They are a collaboration with Reading Public Schools. And I know that they would like to get other public schools um, to, you know, to become a part of the program. They've just not really been successful in doing that. And of course, now with COVID, uh, I, you know, I'm, it, it all looks very different. They're not going out into the community. I don't think they're probably going to any of those jobs that they were going to, that they had um, made roads to get. So it's all kind of sad in that regard, but hopefully we'll pick back up once once this is all over. Mm -hmm. Darcy, do they talk much about post at the school committee meeting? I know you've not been on board very long, but. No, but they did talk about it the other day. And then I found out that the um, Judy, um, I don't know how to say her last name. She's the secretary of the school committee. And I think she works at where you work, Paula. She, um, you know who I'm talking about? I do, I do. Her, her last name begins with a B. I, yeah, yeah. Terrible. I don't even know how to say her last name. She she works up on the North Shore right now. We're trying to hmm. trying to recruit her. Yeah, <laughs> we just needed the state budget to stabilize. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah but she is great. <laughs> Sorry, Paula. Where do you work? I work at Communitas. It's, yeah, formerly yeah. Emark. Yeah. I think there's some folks, some kids from um, Stoneham that go to post as well. So I think Stoneham's on board. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I wasn't aware of that. So that's awesome if they if they are managing to get other communities. Um, a lot of effort was put into putting that program together. Um, the year that my son Dan turned 22, there was a large cohort of students that were going to be moving out of the high school and needed a post program. Um, and Wakefield was very good to me in that they, you know, we went around and we looked at a lot of programs with the special ed director mainly, at programs out of district to see how they were functioning. And then Wakefield agreed to attempt to put something in place, picked and chose the pieces we liked of all these different programs and then tried to bring it all together to put this post in place. Um, you know, because I think they recognized that they didn't have a program in place that was very robust and they had a lot of kids that were transitioning. And um, if the parents had advocated for out of district placement, it would have cost them well above what it cost them to put this program in place. So um, I'm, I'm very thankful for them for doing that. And I'm glad that they've been able to sustain themselves. Um, and hopefully once all this COVID is done, they'll, you know, they'll be able to pick up where they left off. Because my son Dan certainly misses them. Nothing will compare. So. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, so the next item we have on the um, agenda is a discussion regarding uh, 
we're going to start off with sign language interpreter at town meeting. Um, Lois was approached at town meeting or maybe it was after town meeting by someone who was there that was um, hearing impaired that commented that he had a very difficult time. Now, of course, where the town meeting was being hosted at the field house and out in the parking lot but he was having a very hard time hearing things. And so uh, the question came up is what can, you know, what might be some um, moving forward um, if town meeting continues for another turn at the high school and then when it gets back into the Galvin, um, what can we do or what could we recommend to the town to provide support individuals who are hearing impaired. Now, Lorna, you and I had chatted a little bit about that and you had some um, thoughts and suggestions when specifically in regard to having a sign language interpreter there. Right, because we don't know what the, the person that Lois spoke to, what that person's actual needs were, whether they actually require a sign language interpreter or whether they require an assistive listening device or whether they require a, a cart um, stenographer, which that's a computer aided real time stenographer, much like a court um, stenographer. So unless we knew exactly what that particular person needed, we couldn't really just throw in a uh, sign language interpreter if the person actually didn't communicate the sign. Um, and, you know, by law, actually, um, I believe that all public meetings are supposed to be interpreted, which of course they're not. Um, but we don't even put out a notification, like if anybody is interested in attending the town meeting, then, um, you know, that, that request needs to be, you know, um, the request for an interpreter at minimum needs to be two weeks in advance of the meeting. So, I mean, it needs to be posted well in advance that if um, someone needs to have some kind of listening assistance um, or communication access, actually, that would be the, the more proper term for it, um, then, you know, we need at least a minimum of two weeks notice for the town to be able to um, put in a request for a communication access, um, whether that be a cart or uh, a sign language interpreter. Now, um, a device for someone's hearing aids, um, that's something totally different. And that's not something that you just borrow. It's usually something that uh, the town would purchase and have and be able to uh, use it at different meetings. And, then again, there's all different kinds of uh, assistive devices that uh, depending on the, the size of the room, um, the acoustics, depends on what kind of uh, listening um, device would be needed. So there's a lot of variables, but the fact that we don't even ask anybody if they need any um, special assistance for communication access. Um, I think that that's something that we're falling short on. So what, what should be, or what could be the steps that we could take to move forward with that, with doing something? Let's say we can't cover all public meetings, but let's say let's focus on just town meeting which well, is what, I, twice a year? Right. I think so, that that has to come from the, I believe the um, town council or Dr. Oh, yeah, I'm calling him by his father's name, or um, Steve Mayo, um, because that would need to, that information needs to go out whenever they write about the next town meeting and what's gonna be covered in the town meeting then it should be, and that usually comes out before two weeks before a town meeting is done, I believe. Notifications. But we, know, we should know right 
know the date of the next town meeting. I'm guessing that they probably identify the dates, at least for the year of the, the two town meetings. So let's say starting in January, we should know when the two town meetings are gonna be for 2021. Right. So that would, might be a good starting point to approach Steve and say, we feel that you need to advertise. You said we need to reach the individuals who have accessibility issues, whatever those issues may be, and publish something to find out what people's accessibility issues are and then determine how we might be able to help them. So um, I just don't want us to bite off more than we can do because exactly <laughs> if we start getting, uh, I guess if we start getting a lot of responses from the public, that's awesome. But then we just need to figure out what we can, what we do to help accommodate that. Right. Right. Um, as far as as far as um, um, listening devices for hearing aids or people that have lost that have had gradual hearing loss just because of the aging process, there's probably a lot more people in town that don't attend meetings because they can't hear it clearly. Um, so, and I'm not sure when they did the Galvin whether they put in any. Um, soundings to, I don't, I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for, assisted devices in the auditorium in the, in the um, Galvin. That would be something that would be nice to know because um, if the town meetings go back to being done in the Galvin, uh, then at least people, for the most part, at least people that have hearing aids that have the switch or whatever they're using now, um, could access that more clearly and they could attend. Okay, uh, so how about an action plan if we reach out an email to Steve Mayo to just convey this conversation, ask about what if anything at the Gal if the Galvin has that capacity for any type of assistive yeah. technology. And um, I'm wondering if if we, sh you mentioned that by law, all these public meetings should be interpreted. Can we put our fingers on where it states that so we can quote, you know, we can reference that to him? With the ADA, I, I can't put on the actual finger, it, but I believe that the ADA says that any public meeting um, has to be communication accessible for all. Um, I'm wondering if we even just start with uh, like asking them to publicize it and kind of get a sense of the the need. Um, I feel like it's kind of like a two pronged thing. You know, we don't know what the need is, so then we don't know how to to fill the need. Well, exactly, um, it wouldn't be filled. Wouldn't be we wouldn't fill it unless we knew that somebody was actually going to request it. Right. So that's why we would need to put out something about a town meeting well in advance and several times saying if you if you need to have communication access by either a sign language interpreter or a cot um, then that request needs to be put in by a certain date cool. and that request would have to come from the town because when they call into the mass commission for the deaf and hard of hearing to help them they would help search for a um, appropriate person or persons to fulfill that request, one of the first questions they will ask is where does the bill go? So that would have to come from the town because the, the town would be the one that's paying the bill, even though maybe we would put in some money for it, but the town is well, the one that was going to be my next question. Would we be willing to fund some of that? And I have no idea what you know, what we're even talking about as far as the budget for that. Well, I, I have concerns about that, you know, we should definitely scope a need, but I do think the bare minimum is the, like the very bare minimum is a sign language interpreter at at least these two events a year. I mean, I really don't think it's a big ask. I also don't think events should happen if they're not accessible. So, um, it's really, it's the bare minimum to have an ASL interpreter and a cart 
um, person at those meetings. Um, then maybe for the smaller meetings, we, we do a case by case basis. Um, I understand budget is a concern, but I think a larger concern is not allowing people to have access to these very important events. Do we know if this happens in surrounding towns? I'm just curious, because they could be. Uh, I don't know about so that, but I was wondering if we could ask um, if this is a question for Jeff, Jeffrey um, Dugan. Mm -hmm. Or oh, Duggan. Yep. Um, he, I wonder if he has information that could help us. I bet he does. Now, I believe that Stoneham also has a council um, on disability issues. Maybe that we need to find, we need to find that out too. And you know what, he would probably person who could tell us what are the surrounding towns that have councils because um, collaborating with them maybe. All right, I'll take an action to send him an email in regard to this. And then we'll see, um, we'll see what he comes back with. And then um, I can um, I can communicate to all you by email and just talk about next next steps. Anybody else have any questions or comments in regard to that? I agree that um, the town meetings would be an important first step for something like this. Right, and I think once people saw that either saw a um, sign language interpreter or some other type of assistive devices there, um, that might give them the, the confidence to approach about other, other meetings. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is the creation of a banner. Now I sent out the paperwork um, that Levon or Levon actually sent out, I think he copied all of us um, on the quote that you had got. And I know I sent out Lois's information, but of course I don't have it in front of me. Um, I don't know either one of them in front of me. So I don't know if anybody wants to start the conversation on that. Um, your thoughts or opinions? Uh, Levon, could, could you just kind of summarize what you had found out? Because I can't find what I did with it either. Sure. Um, I talked to a man named Matt at New England Flag and Banner in Woburn. And their specialty is creating um, hand applique banners. So they create like those big banners that hang um, like in the Boston Garden, you know, that for like the, if the Celtics win something. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. that's their specialty. And depending on the intricacy of the logo that would go on the sign, that would affect the cost but he looked at the town seal while we were on the phone and he said you know that's pretty intricate um and he said that he would quote around 350 dollars for that so that would be the highest end for something for a six by two and a half foot banner so it would be like something that could hang off of a table, but it could also hang like on the, it would be big enough to hang like on the wall behind, uh, like if we had a meeting and wanted to hang it behind the meeting table. Uh, so it could go on the wall or it could go on a table. Um, you know, if we, the other design that I, I, we had just, just for the sake of cost, um, I also mentioned the bandstand and he looked at that and he said, something like that, which is less intricate, maybe uh, $295. So he gave me a range of like 295 
to $350. Um, and that's for the hand applique. If we wanted to go with something that wasn't quite as fancy and just get something that was printed, seems like maybe just like, a, um, you know, something that would come off of a printer, but it would be on fabric. He said that would be between $150 and $200. So that would be fabric versus like a vinyl. Exactly. Okay. Yep. The hand applique, from what I could see on the website, you know, they're, they're all hand sewn. Um, they're pretty nice. I, th I thought they were nice looking. Um, they reminded me of, uh, you know, like a town flag or, or something you would see like at a town hall or something like that. Not, not something that would be hung like outside on a building. Right. All right, and I'm looking at what Lois sent. Um, so she went to the tea stop here in Wakefield and he quoted her um, for vinyl, five foot by two and a half feet with um, grommets with a town seal, he said would be $90. Um, band stand. Let's see, flap on the side of the table. Okay. So he he's quoting under a under a hundred dollars then um, for something like that. But of course, it's vi it's vinyl, so it's not um, it's not going to be anything fancy. What did what would we envision we would use this for? mainly for to put on a table or put in front of a table um, if we were at an event somewhere to, to advertise the council? Yeah. I think that's <clears throat> what the original thought was. So what are people's thoughts? I think something and I'm not, the only time we did have a banner made up the special ed pack had a banner made up at the tea stop. And I don't recall the price. It was pretty inexpensive. It was red. I think it had red lettering on it. I don't even know that we had a, any kind of emblem on it. And it was, um, you know, it was a piece of vinyl that sat on the table that you would put papers and things on to sort of hold it in place. And then the front of it that hung in front of the table had, had all the information. It was vinyl, so if you spilled something, you could wipe it off. You know, with the, it was nothing fancy. So I don't know. Any have any inputs? I mean, I, I Lois. Yeah, I'm I sorry. Think Go ahead, Darcy. Very time to only because who knows when we're gonna have large events, right? No time soon. Um, but if they were to happen again, I would think it would be more outside events, right? So maybe a vinyl is better in case of the weather or something. I don't know. Yeah. More durable. I mean, I certainly think it's a good thing to have. It's just hard to envision right now when we would need it. Because and I like what you were saying, Marie, about the, you know, you put papers on it and it um, went over the front. I think that's really important. When I was thinking about the banner, I was just thinking about like a uh, vinyl banner and um, those can be a little bit tough to just put on a table if you're like at the farmer's market or, you know, at somewhere else that you're just trying to um, publicize the, the commission. So something that you know, kind of was meant for a table, I think might be, might be helpful. And then maybe something, you know, if we were to do like a intelligent lives like event, something that we could hang. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it could have grommets in it. So if we were somewhere and it needed to be tied to a fence or somewhere, we, we could have that option. But I would think in most instances, we would probably be using it in the front of a table. Well, I wonder if we can um, ask the T-Stop and um, New England Flag, could they, 
could would they be willing to to just draw up some things for us to look at? Do you think Levon that that gentleman would be willing to do that? Yeah, that's that's what he's. Matt is the designer there, and that's that's what he does. He's like a, he's a graphic designer. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. So if you if you wouldn't mind asking him, and I'll have Lois do the same with the T stop. Um, I don't know that the T stop does something similar to that as well. I guess my personal opinion would be I would like to try to do it, keep it in town. You know, just to operate to, to a business in town. According to Lois's little blurb, I just took him out of the email and plugged him into the notes. Um, okay. It says that he would make um, a, um, oh my God, what did he just say? Sorry, now I can't. Think. Yeah, a rendering or something but like that, he would, right? He would, he would make a proof, sorry. <laughs> he would a proof. A design. Okay. Yeah. provide a design. Yeah, I, I think they both would, yeah. All right, well, then let's request that. And at the next meeting, we can we can look at them. Um, I hear what you're saying, Darcy. It's like, what's the rush? <laughs> well, except but for the fact that no, you, you just mentioned the farmer's market. We could have done something there this summer because that, that did happen this summer. Right, right. And um, it's a great way to interact with a community. So we can you know, if this summer, continues, yeah. we're going to have to be creative and look at different options like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it, it could it could happen sooner than we think. Okay, I think we should, so I mean, um, I, I'm just, this is just a thought and I, I'm willing to, to eat, to call him back and talk to him. But if we have a strong feeling of wanting to do business with a, a place in town, I think we should just get a design from them. And then if, if we're not happy with it, then go somewhere else. Okay. I just yeah. feel, I feel, I would feel personally uncomfortable asking him to create a design if we didn't have a strong feeling that we were going to go with him. Yeah, no, I agree. That definitely makes sense. That mm -hmm. definitely makes sense. And if we want to explore the um, more of a flag versus vinyl, we can ask T-stop if they, if that's something they would do too. Right. Okay. We will just reach out to the T-stop at this point and see, ask him for a proof. But I'll ask Lois to inquire about uh, a more of a flag type as well. Um, Okay, so Paula had sent out earlier a list of resources um, that she compiled. You may all not have had a chance to look at it, but um, I thought it was really very comprehensive. And Paula, do you want to attempt to share that? <laughs> sure. I think you just have to give me permission. Yeah, I have to give you share. Share screen. Let's see. Multiple participants can share simultaneously. So let's see. Did I, can you attempt to share? Oh, yep, let's that see. worked. Okay. So I just have it as part of my email here. And my thought was that this isn't like a totally comprehensive list, but maybe like starting with, um, you know, like just the different state services and, you know, maybe you're new to town, maybe you're from somewhere else in Massachusetts or new to Massachusetts, so you don't know what the state resources are. Um, but I think that's a, at least a place to start. Um, and then um, I kind of just, so that's all just state resources. And there are a lot. And I feel like part of what happens at least from what I, I hear from families is that they don't know what they don't know. And so that something like this might be might be helpful. Right. Um, and I, after I had compiled this, I happened to be on the Malden um, city website and they have something similar under their um, commission for, um, for disabilities. Um, 
you know, like disabilityinfo.org, you can probably get just about anything you need there. But again, I think it's just helpful to, to start. And I also wasn't sure like what regulations um, like the town has in terms of what can be on the website. So I thought if we started with something like this, um, then maybe we would have like a, an idea of um, like what, what we could do and what we couldn't do. And, you know, I was just interested in people's feedback on, um, on how much kind of detail to put in there. I, I didn't want to make it so detailed um, that it was too much for people to read. Um, but, you know, also wanted to give people an idea. Um, so some of the things that you see are just like cut and paste from the different agencies websites. Um, and then I thought, you know, specific Wakefield um, agencies that, that support people in Wakefield um, mm -hmm. that were helpful to, to note as well. I, I recall looking when you first sent that to me, you had um, one of the Down syndrome organizations, I can't remember if it was National Down Syndrome Society or National Down Syndrome Congress, but I was thinking in instances in a, either in addition to the national site or in place of the national site, if we had a local organization, like I'm thinking of Mass Down Syndrome Congress, that right. should definitely be included. Um, Absolutely. If we're gonna list the others and, you know, uh, the autistic group I think has a Massachusetts chapter as well. Um, right. I would think it would be better for folks to come to go locally first. Absolutely, absolutely. So Jen, Jennifer McDonald is the person in town who we need to contact per Lois um, that would be able to work with us in getting some of these things on the website. So would you mind taking that action and reaching sure. out to her? Yep, no problem. Well, I, I, I think this is really worthwhile and I, I would love to work further with this on you and with you as well. I think that, you know, maybe doing different like click if you're looking for advocacy organizations if you're looking for um you know that kind of, kind of like category yeah. if you're looking specifically for support etc i think this is definitely really important um so i would love to lend my support for this great my time. good idea me that's awesome yeah the the categories and how much to put is not is what i wasn't sure of um, and we don't know if we're going to have space limitation either on the exactly, website, you know, exactly. or maybe we click a link and she allows it to go to some other page that has all the information. So it's not right on the website, open the our website, you see some heading that says something. Uh, and then, it, and then we go to the, okay, that sounds good. What's the communication person's first name again? I think Jen McDonald. Jen, right, yeah, okay. Yes. So I would encourage you all to take a look at that because if there's, if you feel there's something that's missing, if there's some organization that you're familiar with that you feel strongly should be included um, and communicate that to Paula and Maeve so they can sure to add that. The only thing that jumped out, I, I did, I looked at it prior to the meeting. I thought it looked great. Yeah. Um, the only thing I thought when I was looking at it was maybe the um, procedural safeguards that parents get in regards to special education, um, a link to that PDF, which I think you could get at Desi's website. Right, right. That's a good idea. I also am just noticing that I, I did not receive the email that you sent Paula about this. And I also didn't receive the email that you were discussing earlier about Lorna. Um, I, yeah, so I just thought, look out for that. And I'm, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I will forward that to you. And what I'll do is I'll contact Jen and then see what, what her availability is and get in touch with you. Awesome. And I can send that to you right now. Awesome. Maeve, and what, Maeve, what was the other one you were missing? Yeah. Uh, Lauren, I, see your, I see your name on it, though. What's your oh, email? Is it M. Conway at smith.edu. 
Oh, hold on, hold on. Maybe not. Sorry, oh, I said the wrong no. name. I meant Lois. Oh, Lois, okay. I apologize. Yeah, I am Conway's on that no. one, but not, I don't know about Lois's. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is here, M. Conway. Oh, okay, I'm not, it's not, it didn't never, I have like a filter into the, a folder and maybe it got messed up somewhere in the process. And the other email about, um, you mean Lois's, about the flag, about the banner? Yeah. Actually Did I send it? Marie forwarded it to us, I think. Oh, okay. So okay. you have to search Marie. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Is, is, did I include her on that? No, you, no, did no. I include her? I'll find out. No. No. No, it may have been an issue with, I like filtered um, words related to this into a folder and it may have just not worked out correctly. That may be my issue. Apologies. I resent it, so hopefully it's there. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have it now. Okay. And I'll resend that quote to you, Maeve, after this meeting. Yeah, of course, I can't find it now. Yeah, well, that's my problem, too. We're under too much I find pressure. Them and then I can't find them anymore. <laughs> okay, so the next is the goals and the bylaws. So, um, okay, these were not sent to everybody. So I reached out to Bill Renault. He was, um, he presented at our last, um, at our last meeting. And we talked about whether the, whether the commission does require bylaws or not. And I've not gone through um, in detail the information that he sent me, but I will send it out to all of you. And he, what he says is in regard to bylaws, he said, you do have a bylaw. The town code has a section establishing most of the town's commissions. You can see the um, commission on disability issues and other here, and he sends me the link. Um, the commission on disabilities issue section is pretty thin. Um, but the MGL, what is that? Mass General Laws, okay, includes all of the powers noted in the example um, from the MOD. If you still think it makes sense to update the town's code, I can talk to town council. So that sounds like it could, um, this could become a big to-do, but I will look into this a little bit um, more closely because I believe that Jeff Duggan was pretty clear during his meeting with us that we should have something um, in what we, in, in it references us in the town code, but it's not very substantial at all. Um, another action we sent him off on was in regard, this was Lorna's, I believe, the sidewalk access on trash day. And he said he spoke with public works director on this and planned to include a section on maintaining sidewalk access on trash day in the next town digital newsletter in January. We will also include it in the next public works newsletter in the spring, which goes out to everyone in the town. So between all of us, let's try to remember to look at those documents and make sure that we see that. Um, the other issue he, that he had an action on was the sign um, that we had talked about with the traffic committee going back months now, in particular, um, autist, the autistic child sign is how he's referring to it. And Lorna, what street was that again? Um, wasn't, it was, off, was it off of Bennett Street, off of- I think um, it was Bateman Court. Bateman Court, that's it. Thank you, Paula. And I feel bad because these this family has been waiting all this time thinking that we're pursuing something because we were told that something could be done. And what he says is that I mentioned in the meeting, I didn't believe that there was an approved autistic child sign in the manual for uniform traffic control devices. I confirm that is the case. 
there is a handicap warning sign that could be used instead. And it looks like this. And the example he shows is that picture of, you know, the stick figure in the wheelchair. Um, I, have meant, I have included some traffic engineering reports on the use of these types of signs. The short version is that the signs are not recommended to be used because as a driver, you are expected to pay attention for any kid that may run into the street. However, you can use engineering judgment to install them. I would still be supportive of installing the warning sign if the commission feels that, that this is something that should be done. So I feel like I've seen signs like what we're asking for in other places. I just can't put my finger on it. Um, and I don't think that the sign with an, you know, the handicap sign is appropriate for this. Can we, um, does anybody have any ideas? Like where have we seen these signs? Can we go take a picture of this sign and send it off to him and say, this is what we're talking about. And if it can, if they can post it in town A, then why can't we have one here? I can definitely do that. I can think of um, one in Reading and I just saw another one in Woburn last week. Um, and the one in Woburn was specific for a child with autism. But I think when we asked him about it, he said if it wasn't in that manual, then it wasn't uniform. And so we shouldn't be making up our own signs. Um, so where can, are can you give, attempts? can you, can, I'm sorry, can you give um, Maeve and I just some background on this? Because I think this occurred before we joined the committee. Yes, yes. So we had a few approach us. At, um, so they have a young child on Bateman Court who is autistic and um, he's nonverbal. He ran out, you know, they were coming back from school and you know, mom let him out of the car and they were heading into the house and he, in his head, he was doing something different and he bolted out into the road and um, it nearly got hit basically because he, he went out into the street, the car that was coming, um, you know, barely stopped, barely stopped. Mom was just really, really shaken by the whole thing. And so, uh, they reached out to us um, and asked for some support. They wanted a stop sign. That's how this started. They wanted a stop sign there. Um, and the town um, has refused to do that. They've done a traffic study. They had previously done a traffic study and they determined that the need for a stop sign was, um, was unnecessary in that location. So then it seemed like we came to a compromise on putting up this sign that said autistic child, slow or something like that. Um, and so here we are. I mean, this was at least a year ago. And I, you know, I guess I was under the impression that this was a go. We had talked to um, Lieutenant Anderson from the Wakefield Police Department who was also on the traffic advisory board or maybe he's the chair of the traffic advisory board said he was working with the DPW to come up with the sign. He asked us what we thought it should say and that's how we left it. And we thought that they were just proceeding with that and um, apparently they're not. So I really kind of hate to let it die. I, I I'm just wondering, I don't know the situation beyond what you just said, but I wonder if just a sign that says slow children is appropriate. I, I just, I guess one of the things that just kind of jumps out at me with this is that, is it a violation of the child's privacy to put his disability out in the street in front of his house? Um, and we had, we had that discussion because we felt the same way and we reached out to the family to say, you know, you have any issues with this? And, and they, they did not, they wanted something there, but um, that could be, that could be an option it, and, it, and it may have to be a compromise if um, if that opportunity, maybe that's what we need to find out. What, what other um, 
types of signs are in this regulation, this code of regulations that, that we could look at and choose from that might be suitable. But I'm still curious to know how these other towns are doing this. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if this is a Wakefield thing or um, I'm just curious because this not this remember signs that used to say like slow deaf child like back a, a yes, long time ago. Yes. I haven't seen one of those in a yes. really, really long time. Um, but that's the only kind of sign I've ever seen. Right. Like that. And that and we're not seeing it because maybe it's no long, you know, maybe either A, the code wasn't um, as regulated as it is now. And because this code is so regulated that they, those things are just, they find, they find them not to be allowed. Because I approached the town a handful of years ago. Um, so tr Triangle and Malden and Gordon College had some kind of a, um, an affiliation and they created the handicapped symbol that we're talking about only rather than individuals sitting in um, the in, the individual sitting sitting in the chair, it showed him leaning over. It showed the individual being more active, more mobile, mm -hmm. not just sitting in the chair. And I approached Wakefield about when they were setting up new handicap parking signs, if they would be willing to use that symbol instead of the, the current one, or when they were painting on the, the ground, handicap parking signs, could we use this more, what I was calling up to date? And they were adamant that they would not do that because that new symbol wasn't approved in the code. And, you know, I, I guess I was just like, what difference does it make if that, you know, it, it stay, it's saying the same thing only in a more appropriate way, but. Um, well, it sounds like the code needs to change. Right, I mean, right? but some places are doing it. What they yeah, told me what is. I mean. it, yeah, I mean, it's got to If it's on private property, the owner can, do any kind of sign he wants, but if it's on public property, then it's um, it falls under the jurisdiction of this code, and it has to be within the confines of the code. Because I thought that would be a great project. It was before the Galvin, I think, was put up. Because I thought, okay, and then we could have our kids from Post go over there with you would get the templates from triangle and then the kids would spray paint you know they would spray paint this the symbol on the ground on the parking spot but, but now i just got shot right down <laughs> so well that's too bad so i don't know what are people's thoughts do we pursue this well i think we should pursue it somehow i mean we just not to to just ignore it. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, obviously the, the parents might think that um, we have all forgotten about it and yes. they've given up on thinking that the town's gonna help them out. And I, I hate for them to feel that way. I, I, be I agree. Happy, but I mean, I would hate to even think that they feel that way, that people don't care about what it is that they're facing. Yeah. And, you know, I feel bad because I followed up and followed up and followed up and I was under the impression uh, that the DPW was working the issue only to find out from Bill that, that that they're absolutely not working the issue. And it would have been nice if they had told us that um, previously. Mm -hmm. Do we reach out to the family and kind of just give them an update that we just found out that it had not been completed and where trying to figure out how we can get it to be completed just so that they know that we haven't totally forgotten. Yeah. I can take pictures of the one in Reading in Woburn. I don't know that I could give like the exact location, um, but I could ask. Yeah, that would be great. I, I'm curious to see and, um, you know, and once we get those pictures, it may be, well, I guess we'll go back to Bill with them to get his feedback, 
but then it may be that we need to reach out to those individual towns, maybe to the DPW, or if they commission on disabilities, those folks might know how, you know, was it just because the town agreed to it and it was, it was that simple? Um, Cause I just don't understand if this is a, a state regulation or even a federal regulation, you know, why does some, why can some towns do it and others cannot? So it may just be Wakefield being really stringent about the rules. Um, all right, so Paula, you're going to um, get photos of the signs from these other towns. Yep. So it was Woburn and Reading, you said? Correct. All right. And I'll send the family an email. All right, and if anybody else has any other ideas, just, um, you know what, I'll also ask Bill, um, what signage is currently approved that we might be able to look at? Maybe he could even sure. send us a link to like yeah. that, those regulations yeah. or something, just so we could see. And we could look at them before our next meeting. You know, right. maybe come back. With yeah, I'll, I will forward you this email that he sent to us. Um, I'll do a quick check though, to see if that link that he sent has anything like that. Or if, if we're gonna have to dig for it, I'll just get back to him and say, please tell us where in this link, find this information so that we're not spending hours searching. Okay, and then um, I left on the last item, uh, the intelligent lives, um, just really as a placeholder. I don't want us to lose sight of that. I don't know, does anybody have any other ideas of how we might be able to handle this? I did find out that we can do it easily off of Zoom and that's actually how they've been doing like new hire orientation. Um, which is where they often show it uh, through Zoom and that that's been successful. So we wouldn't be able to put a link on the web on any websites, but um, we could at least publicize a, a Zoom, you know, a registration and then send out a Zoom link. Okay. Um. Oh, shit. And I don't know, you know, I was wondering if we did it, um, I know we were, we were targeting kind of the evening piece, but then I know we had wanted to target um, schools. I didn't know if we could target like a specific professional development day or like a specific time or like right after school, or maybe we do two different showings. I think it depends on the panel conversation. Um, but definitely there's plenty of plenty of options. Well, then let's um, put this on the agenda item for next month and um, yeah, try, try to brainstorm what we think this might look like and who the audience right. might be um, and how we might be able to move forward with this. We would, you know, we would need a couple of months probably to get our advertising going. Um, but we, you know, it would be free because we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be incurring any costs. Mm -hmm. um, Paula, do you know if there's a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a number cutoff as far as how many people can do a Zoom at the same time? I don't know. It depends on the account you have. Like I know our account for work, it's like 120. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and a reg, an, a free account is 45 people, um, but I think the one I have can go up to 500. Mm. So this is different. But Paula, this would have to run off a community account? Well, that was what I wasn't sure of, if we could do it off a community account or if 
it would have to be because it was a commission event if it would have to be off the the town account like i bet it has account. to be off the town account that's what i'm thinking so it would be whatever limit the town has but they must have an unlimited, I mean, they must have the capability of a large. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Because they do all their meetings. Right. I mean, yeah, so. So Communitas, who has the license for this, would allow it to run off a town account. So I have, they would just have to share the screen with me. I have access through the server okay. to it. Um, so technically we could run it, uh, you know, one, yep. we could, we could run it. Okay. Uh, you know, off of our, um, meeting and then you would, you would run it off for your computer. Okay. Right. That's sounding more doable. Okay. All right. Does anybody have anything else? that they want to bring up tonight? No, no key doke. If someone wants to make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay, someone on a second? I'll second it. All right, so we are going to adjourn our December 7th meeting at 8.43 p.m. Um, and we'll be all be in touch by email with our actions and see you, wow, next year. I know, <laughs> incredible. Oh, holidays for everybody. Yeah. Yes, yeah, same to you. That's right. Happy yeah. holidays to everybody. And um, stay safe. Yeah. Yeah. Stay safe, stay healthy, and let's hope for a better 2021. A better 21. No kidding. <laughs> thank you all all right thank you all thank we'll you. talk soon bye. Thank bye, -bye. You. Bye, -bye. bye 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 bye